I don't have three words for you today. I only have one. That word is press. We're going to be talking a little bit more about that word and how it applies in going through these verses. But that word press is not simply moving on. It's not simply moving forward. Whenever you look at what it means, pressing literally means to push forward, continuously adding force and moving forward. Not just simply taking a step, but actually like there's something in the way and that I'm going to push it forward and move it along. So that whenever everything's going on in the world, there's been a lot that has occurred. Whenever there's all struggles, whenever we're discouraged, whenever we're disheartened, whenever we feel that there is no hope, whenever there's a lot of anger and animosity around us and in the world, we can still push forward. We can still set those things to the side and we can still motivate ourselves to continuously moving forward to that goal. Be with me, if you will, in Philippians chapter 3. I'm going to read the verses that our brother Lucas gave to us and I want to also appreciate the songs that Sean led for us this morning. Philippians chapter 3, beginning again in verse 12. Not that I have already obtained or am I am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forward to these things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. How beautiful those words are. Specifically, whenever I was going through basic training, you have about seven and a half weeks of being yelled at basically every single day, being told exactly how you are to move, how you are to act, how you are to conduct yourself. And all that comes along to one specific day where you're celebrating your graduation. You, you march around a pavilion for people to watch. You stand in front of a crowd. You recite the, the words they give you about how you are promising to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and, and domestic, so on and so forth. And then once you complete that, we all who are graduating at once shout, Aim High Air Force. The point of that being, and the reason why the Air Force has decided that to be the slogan of Aim High, is to set our eyes on things above, to set our minds on what we can achieve, that the sky's the limit, that we can continuously be looking forward to something and being the best that we can, both as an individual person and as a group and a force within the military and within the United States. And us as Christians have to have that same kind of mentality, not just with pressing, but also looking ahead, just as it talks about in these verses, as it also talks about in Hebrews, about looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, that we are continuously looking forward to something. We have to be laying a hold of what's ahead, as it talks about at the very beginning in verse 12, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ has also laid hold of me. To get a little bit of context of what he's talking about with what's ahead, we're going to read verses 7 through 11 real quickly. In verses 7 through 11 it says, But what things were gained to me, these I have counted for loss. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ, Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain the resurrection from the dead. So picking up with those verses, it is specifically the resurrection itself that he's speaking of, that we're pressing on to lay hold of, that we are looking to. That one resurrection that was and that has to come as well. Around the first century and around the time of Jesus, especially after his death, there was a large group that continuously taught that there was no resurrection, there was no afterlife. The Sadducees were very, very vehement in spreading that there was no resurrection. It even got to where it was a temptation, it was a struggle within the church itself in the first century. Paul even has to address this. If you look with me, go to 1 Corinthians. If you go with me to 1 Corinthians, look in chapter 15. 
specifically in chapter 15, if you go down to verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12 says, Now if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and that your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. I want to reflect on that just a little bit. Our entire lifestyle, everything that we do, every bit of who we say we are, is founded upon that one moment, upon that one person, Christ Jesus. That he came to this earth, that he preached, that he was put on a cross, but that he also was resurrected and came back three days later. If that had never happened, if that had never occurred in history, of all men we are the most pitiable. Because we base everything on that. We put all our chips down on who Christ is and what he has done for us. How devastating that is if that didn't occur. And that's what Paul's exactly having to address with the Corinthian brethren. That look, you put everything on him. So how can you be saying that there is no resurrection? How can you even be considering that there is no resurrection? Shows how your faith is futile if he's not. But we have confidence and we have strength and we have assurance that Christ did return. That Christ did say what he said he would do. That Christ did come back from the grave. We can even look at the end of John, how it writes about how all these things have occurred and all these writings have been recorded so that we may believe and we have confidence and faith in who Christ is and how wonderful that is. But even in John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26, Jesus picks up there as well, John 11 Looking at verses 25 and 26, he says, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Jesus himself is calling himself the resurrection and is saying to lay hold of it as well. And so we must do the same whenever we are pressing forward that we are laying a hold of that resurrection. There's also eternal life that we are to lay hold of. We have 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12 as well. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 12 it specifically says, Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold of eternal life, to which you are also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Because there was the resurrection of Christ, but there is going to be a day where we are facing the judgment, where the, the dead do indeed rise, and there is eternal life that is waiting for us. But that can be good, and that we have eternal bliss, that we have eternal peace. Or there's an eternal condemnation. It's even recorded in John chapter 5. Look, look with me in John chapter 5. John chapter 5, if you look in verse 28 with me. Jesus speaking again says, Do not marvel at this. For the hour is coming in which all who are in the grave will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. So we have a decision to make whenever we are laying a hold. How are we laying a hold? Are we laying a hold of righteousness or of our own selfish desires? That can lead to either eternal life and peace or eternal condemnation. But we still have to be laying hold of what's ahead. We have to be striving forward. We also have an inheritance that is coming our way that we can lay hold of as well. We go through Ephesians chapter 1, and we've talked about this before. Our brother Gary Holderby uh, often talks about these verses as being some of his favorites as well. And as you go through those verses, chapter, verses 11 through 14, and really 
going back even back further to the beginning of the chapter, we have all these blessings that are found in Christ. But specifically, at the end, he talks about an inheritance that is there for us in heaven. And whenever you think about what heaven is, whenever you consider the scriptures that are discussed about heaven, we don't know exactly what it looks like, but each portion that it gives of what heaven is like is nothing but pure peace, nothing but pure beauty, nothing but pure majesty. And in Ephesians, with Paul saying that that is the inheritance that we have to look forward to. Why would I not want to lay hold of that? Why would I not want to look forward to having peace, rest, comfort? I brought up before about how there's been a lot that's going on in the world, a lot of things that are going on around us. We feel tired, feel exhausted with what's going on. It feels like it's difficult to deal with every single day. Paul talks about how he had gone through so many struggles in preaching the gospel. But then whenever he writes to Timothy, you can almost hear him taking just a deep sigh of relief that finally I have my inheritance. Finally there's a crown laid up for me. That's what heaven is. That's that inheritance that we're laying hold of that finally... I can shed this world away, and I can have that moment of bliss, of true bliss. But we also forget what's behind. Picking up in verse 13 of Philippians chapter 3, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. Whenever we talk about what we're forgetting what's behind us, we're forgetting about that guilt that we have. Forgetting all the mistakes that have been made. Forgetting all of the actions that have been so wrong that we may seriously regret. Hebrews goes on and on. If you go from the beginning of it to chapter 12, about how Christ is more superior in every single way. That according to the old law, if you compare it to Christ, it is nothing. That Christ is better in every single way. And then it concludes with Hebrews chapter 11 going through the different heroes of faith who even before the New Testament period, even before the time of Christ, recognized that there was still something greater to lay hold of as well. And to forget everything that's going on around them, forget everything that has happened before them, and looking forward to what's better to come. And then it reaches to Hebrews chapter 12 verses 1 and 2. Of saying, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside the weight which so e- and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let's move forward. Forget, forget all that's gone on. Yes, you may have been, you feel like you're the worst person. Yes, you may feel that you have done worse and have been a more sinful person than anyone else. You can lay that aside now. You can forget those things. You don't have to remember the guilt anymore. And you can look to Jesus. You can lay a hold of Jesus as well. But we also have to forget our successes as well. And there are some successes that we do lay a hold of and that we do still remember. But whenever we say forgetting our successes, we have to make sure that we mean it the right way. Whenever we talk about that, we're talking about successes where we feel like, well, I am the one who has achieved this. Look at all that I have done. Look at all that I have set aside for myself. Look at how righteous I am that I have made for myself. That's what he's talking about with forgetting our successes. Lay that to the side. Because it is not you. You do not have the power. We even have the parable as well and Luke, whenever the, the man saying, look at all I have built upon for myself, look at the wealth I have accumulated, I'll set aside another spot of land for a, a bigger barn, for all my wheat to accumulate, and then soul be at rest. Look at all of you created. God's saying you're a fool, and tonight your soul will be required of you. We don't achieve things on our own. We do strive to accumulate things for ourselves. We do strive to be righteous. 
but it is Christ who gives us the strength. It is Christ who gives us the increase. And so we have to forget about ourselves and remember who it is that we do serve. Look in Jeremiah chapter 9. If you'll look with me in Jeremiah chapter 9, picking up in verse 23. Jeremiah chapter 9, picking up verse 23, says, Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, let not the mighty man glory in his might, nor let the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, exercising his loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord. That's who we reflect upon. That's who we lay hold of. Not forgetting, or not laying hold of ourselves and that we have achieved well, but that God has given us so much. We also have to forget about the cares of the world as well. There's been a lot that has been able to distract myself and so many others, both with politics, with finances, with family. We have to remember that the things of this world are going to crumble away, that they don't mean anything. We can't carry any of these things with us once we go on. If you look with me in Luke chapter 21, Luke chapter 21, In Luke chapter 21, picking up verse 34, it says, But take heed of yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life, and that day come on you unexpectedly. We live in a nation where we also have a lot of blessings. We don't have to worry about most times where our next meal is coming from. We don't have to think about how we're going to get through the next day. We thankfully don't have to worry about any kind of persecutions for what we believe. We can come here freely, not having to fear that someone's going to attack us just because we decide to serve God. And so we have a lot of riches, but those things do not matter. It talks about where your treasure will be, where your heart will be, all, there your heart is. We have to make sure that our heart is in the right place, forgetting about the cares because they do nothing for us. It talks about in Ecclesiastes, he talks about how vanity of vanities, all is vanity. The entire cares of this world, the entire riches that we can accumulate, none of it matters. What does matter is Christ. What does matter is God. What does matter is laying a hold of heaven. That's what matters. So we have to forget what's behind us. And then finally, pressing forward. Pressing forward to that goal that it talks about, verse 14. And it is talking about striving whenever it talks about pressing forward, of continuously pushing against the grain, so to speak. Now we have to move forward with purpose. If you look in 2 Timothy chapter 4, picking up at verse 7. We mentioned these verses before, but just to reiterate, Paul saying in chap chapter 4, verse 7 of 2 Timothy, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all those who have loved his appearing. So what is your purpose for moving forward? Are you truly laying a hold of that being your purpose of going to heaven, of being with Christ someday? And this is not to put anyone down, or is, and this is not to hopefully diminish anybody, but it is to, a reminder and hopefully words of encouragement that we can lay a hold of Christ. We can lay hold of the resurrection that is to come. We can look to Jesus. Whenever you look at the Old Testament, they had one specific day that one man was able to go into the holiest of holies in the temple. 
and have that, that connection, that, that one place where God is. Only one day of the year. Fast forward to today. I can freely and openly and willingly go to my Creator. I can speak directly to Him. I can cast all of my cares, all my wants, all my concerns. I can lay it all before Him every single day. I can lay hold of resurrection. I can lay hold of what's to come. I can look forward to what I have. How great a blessing that is. So why not move forward with purpose? Why not continuously press when I have so great a blessing as being able to speak with my Creator every day? We have to move forward with determination as well. Look with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. First Corinthians chapter 9, if you look in verse 24. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now do they, they do not obtain they, excuse me, now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not with one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. You think about these big marathon runners, you see the big boxers or, or mixed martial arts fighters. Each precise movement that they make, they're determined and they have a purpose for whatever they do. That marathon runner, he runs countless miles day after day after day after day for that race, to prepare for that race, so that whenever he does run that race, he can know exactly the pace that he needs to set. He knows exactly when he needs to pick up the speed. He knows when he is going to have hardship. He knows when it's going to be most difficult for him along that race. So he prepares, and he's determined to finish. That boxer, that fighter, they train their muscles to build strength. They condition themselves to be able to last the entire fight. They don't swing about just throwing wild haymakers or whatever punch you, you, you want to call it in order to just hopefully make contact with the other person. They have specific determination and purpose with every punch that they throw. There's purpose and determination with each movement that they make in training as well. We have to have that same type of motivation, that that is our entire life. That I'm running that race. I know when that race is going to be difficult for me. So I make sure I have the correct purpose and the right determination. And I press forward without settling. In Jude chapter 3, it talks about contending earnestly for the faith. I have to ask myself a lot of times, am I truly moving forward or am I just settling? Because it's those moments where I feel that I am comfortable, that I am content, that I settle, that is very easy for me to fall. And that's something that I have to personally watch out for. And I know so many others may have that difficulty as well. So whenever I'm pressing forward, whenever we all are pressing forward, don't settle for where you are spiritually. Do not settle for where you are spiritually. A spirit that settles is one that is very easily tempted to decline and tempted to begin to fall away. We talked about that purpose and determination that that runner, that boxer has. They don't just settle for where they are. They don't just settle for, well, I'm comfortable at the pace I am right now, and so I'll be fine to win the race later. 
There's other people around them who are pushing so much harder if they are settling. And so that runner has to continuously push forward as well. Like we talked about with almost an object being in the way, that having to push it forward, to propel yourself forward, that means that there is no settling. And so we have something great to lay hold of. We can lay hold of the resurrection. We can lay hold of Christ Jesus. We can lay hold of eternal life. But we also have a great blessing that we can forget all the guilt. We can forget the shame. We can lay aside the things that we once did. We can lay aside the person that we once were. And we can continuously moving forward. So the question I want to ask you is, are you indeed pressing forward? Are you indeed looking ahead to what's to come? Are you indeed looking ahead to what it is that you may lay hold of? If you're not this morning, I strongly encourage you to. If there are those here this morning who have not been baptized, who have not become a follower of Christ, you have not laid hold of the resurrection yet, but you still can. There may also be some this morning who have committed themselves to Christ, but have since fallen away. And I want to encourage and express that you can once again lay hold of Christ. He stands waiting for us. We have to take every opportunity that we can. If there's any needles, please come forward as we stand and as we sing.